what are you? I don't know. It, it started with custom cars. Yeah. Uh, like when I was a kid, I used to get um, I used to get a comic called Shiver and Shake yeah. every week. And one day I went down to the news agent. Is, is that loud enough? That's perfect. Yeah. I, can hear it. I went to the news agent and there was a hot car magazine on the shelf. Hot car. Who remembers hot car? And, uh, <laughs> Love that man. And there was a, the front cover, I've still got it at home, there was a Mini, and they'd filled the rear windows in and port, put portholes in it, which in like 1976 was yeah. really cool. Yeah. Um, and I didn't buy my comic. I went home and got some more pocket money and I went down and got a hot car. Yeah. And I was probably 10 then. Yeah. Um, and from then on, the comics never got bought and hot car became, and then street machine, and then custom car. Um, and I just love the creativity and the fact that everything looked so different. Everyone was, everyone could put their own ideas into a car and nothing was wrong and nothing was right. It was just what you wanted from your car. Yeah. Um, and that's where it started. And it's only like I'm, I turned 60 this year and um, through experience, like the 63 cars I've built now, yeah. um, and through that experience, I've just got better and better at looking at curves and shapes um, and, and knowing that that shape or that curve will fit something. Um, so come on then, how much of it is an art and how much of it is a science? Because you've got to know your nuts and bolts, surely. Uh, I suppose it's about 50%. Yeah. Like when I'd done um, the Bentley Mulsanne a few years ago, yeah. which I called Mentally Insane, yeah. um, like a play on words, I, I, got, I was lucky enough to get the rear windscreen um, and the glass roof panel from a Mercedes 300 Roadster hardtop. Yeah. Now, this is just bizarre, right? I, I got this rear screen and the back screen was out of the car. I'd made my own roof pillars and I laid the Mercedes screen onto the Sarade 4 of the Bentley yeah. and it fitted actually all the way along until about an inch before the end where the glass curved up about a quarter of an inch. Right. So I just put an infill in there. That was luck. It was luck, but, but it was almost have... like it, it was meant to be. Don't you lie in bed at night thinking, hold on, there's Mercedes roof fit on top. Do you, no. You don't? Uh, when, when I'm building a car like that, um, that started uh, here five years ago. I think this is why uh, Beely wanted me up here. Five years ago, um, I bought the four wings at yeah. the Auto Jumble. And what are the, what are the wings off? Uh, they were off of a standard Delahaye 135 sedan. Okay. Um, and the guy had rebodied it many years ago with a race body. Yeah. Um, and he kept the panels because he wanted to build himself a Delahaye and he never did. Yeah. And uh, I bought the four wings. Well, I saw them on the Saturday and they were quite a lot and of money. They were in the field, yeah. They were in the field. Yeah. Um, and that night, I, I was staying in a camper. I went on to Google on my phone, which is something I don't do much of anyway. But I typed in Delahaye coach bills, and obviously, the, I've got some pictures. The two most famous cars um, are the Fagoni and Falashi, and the Saichik. Let me take this now, down and show people. The Saichik car is the one that Diana Dawes ended up with. And uh, I looked at those two pictures, and I just thought, well, the wings that I've seen aren't nothing like that. But where am I going to get them again? And on the Sunday I went back and I, I didn't have enough money, but I made him an offer and he took it. And then when I got a moment, I started to research these. I got wheelbases and such like that off the net. And then I just, I basically looked for a chassis and the Riley came about. The Riley is like a coat hanger, really. The Riley came about to hang those panels on. Yeah. Um, once the chassis was restored, I did lengthen the wheelbase because this car's 3.2 metres long on the wheelbase and I thought if I get the right length wheelbase to start with, I've got more chance of getting the proportions right. Sure. Um, and then I, I, I held the wings on there, like I've only got a double garage, this was done, there's broom handles and there's bits of masking tape and everything, but when it's in the right place you start to tack it and then it starts to take on its own form. So you started then, you, you saw these four wings and then you had the vision, is that right? Because you knew... The, the vision, vision grew, started. yeah. yeah. I, I didn't, when I bought them I didn't quite know what they were going to be, but I knew along the lines of where it was going to go. Yeah. Um, and it, it had to be this style of car like the wings weren't the wings were off of a standard saloon so they weren't either of these shapes but they were good enough so the front wings on that car have been lengthened by 10 inches yeah uh the back wings have been lengthened twice by six inches uh six inches above the wheel and then on the tail when we come to make the tail 
I didn't think it was ostentatious enough, so I cut the last two foot off and moved that back six inches. So they've just, got a 12 I'm just inch. Out that we're talking spread. about this incredible lavender coloured creation that you can see behind you. This beautiful, beautiful Dullahay 2. And there, another lavender coloured creation behind the lavender coloured creation <laughs> as well. <laughs> that's, Excellent. That's Maxine, the car artist. Hello, Maxine. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so you, you got these. And, how long ago was this? That was five years ago. Five years ago. And that then you were set on, on your journey there. Uh, yeah, and then uh, like the, the convertible top, right? I've, I've spoken to a lot of people about this, but some of you probably won't have heard of me talk about it. But obviously it's got to have a soft top. So I started to look for anything that was a modern soft top frame, something, something good quality. And I was looking at all these BMWs and stuff, taking notes of the model numbers. And I thought if I, BMW's possibly the most common of a car to be a convertible, and uh, I didn't really care what it was. But um, I went to walk the dog one day and I turned into the estate and at the side of the road, there was a Ford Street KA. Right. And I just looked at it and I thought, that's the roof that I need. Yeah. That's the roof. And I'm not gonna have to go to a scrap yard because I can find a scrap one on eBay. And I bought one for 200 quid with a torn roof and a head gasket gone. Um, I went to Machine Mart and bought a nine inch cutter and I cut the thing into three pieces and the center piece from the B pillar back to above the back wheel went in its entirety onto the floor pan of the Riley. Oh wow. And that piece from the B pillar to like the curve of the wing is Ford Street KA. Wow. That panel and everything, the, the tonneau cover, I would imagine if you took it off and put it on the Diana Dawes car would pretty much nearly fit it's that correct and that's a steel panel it had a third brake light in it which i had to fill in um, and then the top of the boot lid of that car the first 10 inches of the boot lid and all the hinges are also ford street ka so that's if you want to have a look when i've finished come on over and i'll show you yeah that one is and, and it's just it's so easy using parts from something else because I'm, I'm not trained i've self-taught um, and I've had all these coach builders coming over this weekend and talking about it. And like, if they actually saw the way I did it, they probably would, I don't know if they would dislike it or if they stand back and wonder how I did it. But, well, I'll tell you what, um, my readers it's would love you for it. It's a very practical classics creation, that, yeah. in its own way. Um, well, the, the windscreen, right? The windscreen's um, 1986 Mini. Brilliant. The, the side chick car, the blue one, um, had a split screen, but it was curved. Yeah. Now that's that's really unusual because all split screens were because they couldn't curve the glass. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to replicate that on that. And I I phoned the glazing people that I use, and I said, "How much is a mini windscreen?" He said, uh, "72 quid trade." So they sent one over, and what I'd planned to do was cut it in half, just over half, so it was like about uh, five eighths. Yeah. And then have two of them cut so that you had a split screen, and. When he dropped the screen over, it was Easter, I think, and I was working a weekend on it. I, the doors had no slam panel at the time. The doors were just hinged at the back. So the width of the scuttle could have been anywhere. Yeah. And I held this mini screen up and it, it, was, it was perfect. And that windscreen is a completely standard 86 mini screen. And the split down the middle was just a trim. Oh, right. So, so it's cosmetic. If, yeah. yeah. So if, any, if anything ever went through that, it's 72 quid for another screen. So it's pra practical, <laughs> it's practical, but I've achieved exactly what Sauchik did. Amazing. So you got, you, what, Riley, did you get an RMA, was it? I, don't, I can't tell you. Right. RM something or other. Right it's super cheap at the moment. It's, yeah, that was a two and a half litre one. Yeah. Two okay, and, and you've used the two and a half litre rental? I have, yeah. yeah. That was in, that was more expensive than buying a Chevy small block. Yeah, they're not cheap. <laughs> I've, I've, I've got a Riley Pathfinder and I've, I've got the same two and a half litre in mine. Right. And it's a it's very expensive engine. Everything is four. It's like Formula One prices. It really is. Yeah. You've got the white metal bearings, all that. Yeah. Stuff, you know, tough, yeah. Tough stuff. But you've done that work as well. So it's a running driving vehicle. Is that right? It is. Yeah. It's not on the road yet. Right. Um, I've probably done about forty miles in it. Yeah. Uh, when we brought it up here for the hot rod show on the Saturday night, we actually went up to pub in it. Oh, and nice. uh, Maxine was a bit scared of the width of her Buick, so she'd never driven anything that wide left-hand drive. Yeah. So she drove her Buick, and, and I drove that up to the pub, and then we come back and we went all through the new forest, and nothing fell off or anything, so it's really oh, quite wow. good. Wow. I could class that as quite a positive first drive. So that's, a, that's a, I mean, I'll tell you what, I would like to know, what was the reaction you get on the road when you're in something like that? Oh, it's, it's, well, it's funny, actually. Younger people, like, 
I've been in this scene all my life, and, and younger people used to love it, but just round the corner from our garage there's a school, and if you go past there when school's kicking out, there's probably only one in every 30 that'll even look up from his phone. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. it's so weird, like, you know, that... If I'd come out of school when that went past me, I'd have fallen over. Yeah. But, um, but on the whole, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's not like it would have been 20 years ago, but it's, it causes a lot of reaction. Looking up from your phone is, is something that almost nothing can do. That's no, these days. that's right. Addiction. They're addicted. Very strange. Um, so you, five years in the bill, was it continuous five years? No, because I, I work during the uh, day as well. Okay. So it's You've got an MOT, haven't you? Yeah. Right? You're an MOT? Yeah, yeah, 40 years. Excellent. So, so you actually, I mean, that's an interesting thing because you see cars all the time and they come through your workshop. And I suppose when you're working on something like this, that knowledge of car shape must play oh, into it. Quite often, well, not so much with all this plastic that they're bringing out on the production yeah, lines now, but yeah. um, it used to be that someone would come in and go, wow, look at that headlight. Yeah. And then I'd go find that headlight and and that still does happen occasionally but everything now is just generic so and, and you wouldn't want to use it if you probably couldn't get one even if you wanted one no but um that has been quite useful during the time so okay. i can't think of a, a for instance at the moment but um uh, yes that that has been quite useful we, we've been there like 40 years and we used to do like 20 years ago we used to do all the cowlick beetles we, we even had one bloke used to bring two london to brighton cars to us many nice. years ago but obviously through time, everything over 40 year old doesn't need to come in now, so no. it is all now just plastic rubbish. Plastic nonsense. Um, but, um, the colour is extraordinary, what's the colour? Uh, the colour is, um, basically it came from the idea of, of a bluebell. Yeah. Um, we, we, Maxine saw some bluebells growing by the railway track and, and we got down and, and looked at it and I, on the Tuesday after Easter, I went and picked one and I went to Rainbow Paints and I just asked for their metallic la lavender colours and they, they mixed me three tester pots and I blew them all out on a bonnet and that colour is a Mercedes commercial colour. It hasn't even got a name, it's just it it's something like Mercedes A5612. Wow. So what it's from I've no idea because I've never seen it on a truck no, over it. <laughs> um, possibly just a, a commercial worldwide colour maybe. Yeah. But from but the colour of the blue It's a bar. lovely colour. Yeah. And the steering wheel as well, that's an extraordinary piece. Yeah, the, the Sauchik car, uh, Diana Dawes's had that. Sauchik had this um, thing for making everything yeah. like completely over the top. And he designed a wheel like that for most of his coach built stuff of that period. And when it got to it, I thought, I've, I've got to have something flashy yeah. um, on, on the dashboard. So the actual spokes are from Just Campers. It was a reproduction Porsche. Uh, uh, banjo wheel, oh, right. and then I cut the rim off of it, and I went to a place called Dolphin Marine in Paul, and I said to him, "Look, I want this. This is the diameter it's got to be." And they milled it out of a lump. I don't know if you call it billet, would you? And it's acrylic, but it was one clear cast yeah. lump. Um, it, it cost me 250 quid, I think, That's but it was right. worth every penny. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, and then the the little badge at the arm push in the middle is um, a Lalique. Um, mascot, uh, well, badge, dashboard, yeah. St. Christopher. And I bought that at the Classic Car Show in Birmingham 25 years ago for a purpose, and it didn't fit that purpose. Right. And I could, I've never been able to use it on anything because it didn't fit. And I, I ground the lugs off of it, and it's just stuck in there with a bit of double-sided tape. Meant to be, Andy. Yep. It's meant to be. That's how <laughs> it happened. Tell us about the mascot on the front. What's that all about? Uh, well, I actually got the, the grill, although that's not the grill I got, the, the Series 1, if you like, pre-war grill, which is that grill, yeah. um, the, I got on the, uh, on the red one, that's pre-war, and the one in the picture of when I bought it was a post-war one. I managed to find during lockdown one in France oh, um, okay. from a, a bloke. and It looks it like a Hotchkiss uh, grill. Almost. Similar, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Delahaye did have that sort of almond shape. Yeah. Um, anyway, it turned up and it was, I thought it was going to be chrome on brass, yeah. on steel. Well, it turned out like the old motorcycle tanks where it was pressed steel and in chromed. Oh, and it was rotten. Oh, like oh, it was, okay. I, I paid far too much for it. Cause yeah. We ended up using the top half of the yoke only. Yeah. And then my mate Matt made the insert. But um, what was the question? I forgot what the question I was. was. About the mascot. The mascot <laughs> oh, the mascot. Yeah. It came with 
an original Delahaye mascot, oh, right, okay. which was not particularly big, um, but it was very pretty. And then two weeks before it was going for paint, I couldn't find the mascot. And I, I just thought it had been thrown away. It was at, that was at work in a box of stuff at work and it just disappeared. Right. And I got a friend in New York, an old boy, um, he's in his 80s and he's the absolute master of, of Art Deco and tin plate toy cars okay. and there's nothing he doesn't know. And I sent him an email and I said, John, I don't suppose you've got anything that is geometric overload as a mascot. And he sent me a picture of that about four hours later and he said, Andy, I'm at an uh, auto jumble in Pennsylvania. This is $250 if you want it. And I just went, John, just get it for me. Well, when we got it back, um, and it came over, the perspex was yellow and horrible, so I had that cut again. But um, it's actually standard 1959 Ford American bonnet masket. Oh, is it? They fitted it to the 49 and 50 Ford, which is, it must have been so old fashioned when that came yeah, out, because it's that, a 30s that's masket. Very warm. Um, since then, in the Rally of the Giants and that over here, I've seen these Fords, and they're just done in the centre of the bonnet. Yeah. But on there, it looks superb. It does. And then what we've done then to tie it into the windscreen is that, that, that bead down the windscreen, we, we've extended that to the bonnet chrome, um, and then there's a, an infill of perspex there, so it ties the front mascot to the windscreen. Nice. Nice. Really, over the, over really the last uh, three cars now, I've done three split windscreens now, Tetanus, the, the cord, had that like chrome nostril. Yeah. Um, Metropolis had the fat chrome one, the Peugeot, with the, the brass ladder going up it, and then that one's got the Perspex. And I'm, I'm doing this um, 34 Lance here at the minute, and I want to do another wild, um, really wild split screen, and, yeah. and I can't come up with an idea. Uh, and I've, I've designed and drawn and stuck things on it. Anyway, I've just done it about three weeks ago. I, I can't get a split screen with another really wild split. So I've actually made the split another window. So I've got a three piece window. Okay. So the one in the middle looks like a Spitfire nice. aeroplane windscreen and then two splits and then another window each side. So I've I've got a three piece screen now. Okay, this, this is leads me to my next question about how you, how you create your visions. Um, do you start with all the drawings? Do you start with a complete idea, or does it evolve as you go it along? It usually evolves. Okay. Um, I, I get a very good idea of, of what I want, and then it just grows. So, sometimes I don't think you can really picture that in your head at the beginning and have it finished looking exactly as you pictured it, because yeah. uh, it, it can't work like that. There's going to be something in the way or, or something that physically is impossible to get that shape. So you have to be flexible. But you I mean, also have to. Have... I mean, you got the inspiration to start with. There. Yeah. And you and you aim in that direction. Yes. And, it and then it sometimes it diversifies. Sometimes it comes out exactly the yeah. same. Yeah. So yeah. looking at, I mean, for me the 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 wings are beautiful. The bonnet's fantastic. But the the part of of that creation which I love the boat the most is the rear end. Yeah. How that that boat tail slopes down, and there's a fin. Talk about that. Well, firstly, what's the boot lid? Is it two RM boot lids welded together? Or? You're, you're not on too far away. Oh, right. no. Okay, go on. <laughs> I've had an RMA, you see, so I recognise bits and bobs. The, uh, the boot lid, um, the, the tonneau cover is Street KA. The first 10 inches of the boot lid is Street KA. Okay. So that gives me all of the position then for the rain gutters and everything. So. I haven't got a rolling machine. People think I have, but I haven't. Everything is like old rubbish cut and welded together to get the shape I want. You're kidding. I, I haven't got a rolling. I've never, I've never used one, no. Oh, my goodness. No, it's all like um, used other well, panels. Well, there's hope for us all then. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the, the rear panel behind the door is the rear door skin from the Riley. Yeah. yeah. That comes up and, and welds to the edging of the Ford Street KA. Yeah. The Ford Street AK, the Street KA hard uh, tonneau cover goes like that and then the car bellies out. It's a fat side. Yeah. So I cut that off and I left a half inch flange and then to that flange I welded the Riley door skin. Okay. Um, that gave me a position then for the wing to touch. And then this is absolutely this is absolutely honest on saying here. The two long panels that edge the boot lid that was two strips of steel. They, they were seven inches wide with a half inch return. Yeah. And I tacked them to the little bit of the KA that I had. And the curve of that is the natural curve caused by gravity. <laughs> and where they come down, that was the length of the back of the car. 
and really? in the, the curve at the bottom. Well, it's organic, it's, I suppose. Isn't yes, it? yes, it can't really? be any more natural. No, well, actually, to know something, there's something in that, isn't it? Because one of the things that always impressed me about all your creations is there's there's something about nature about them, all of them, even even things like the two CB Picasso. You know, I just I absolutely adore that. It's a, mm. a magical yep. thing. Um, well, that, that, they fell down, and then the curve at the very bottom of the car, the nice rain behind the bumper, um, that's just a piece of exhaust tube. Um, I right. took it down the tube place. They, they put the curve in it that I wanted, and then the boot lid is the first section, as I said, is Street KA, and then there's four quarters of two different Riley boot lids in there. Right. I, it's all Riley RM, but I didn't have enough length in one because they're stubby. And what's so, the thing? Uh, that's a bit of uh, free mill bar. <laughs> <laughs> you have, I mean, it's sort of like coach building. When you look at old bits of scrap, what you, you, you must have you must have the most extraordinary thoughts. There's nothing, I just bought, I, bought ran, I bought round there on Friday and I bought the front mudguard from a Lambretta scooter and, and this really ugly wheel um, wheel cover from a sidecar yeah. because I what I'm, this Lancia thing I'm building. I saw just two weeks ago a '39 Lincoln Zephyr. Yeah. And the dashboard is just the most stunning thing, but it actually comes down like a bustled waist and it comes down to the floor pan. And I want to do, I've got a Packard Speedo head for this uh, thing, this Lancia, and I want to bring it down to the gearbox tunnel. And I've bought this Lambretta mudguard. I'm, I'm absolutely positive that's the panel I want. Yeah. Now I found on eBay, I found a 39 Lincoln Zephyr dashboard last week and it's $3,000 and it's in Los Angeles. This mudguard was 15 quid. I knocked him down to a tenner and it's going to do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you are the perfect man for this show. And I, I'm completely understanding why we are sitting here at the Beauty Auto Jumble with that work of art, but with you saying what you're talking to me about now, which is that you, you go out and you look at the rust and you see something that yeah. most people don't, to be honest. I was talking to someone on Friday and they said, Oh, the last year here, I bought two fiberglass fairground ride cars from a bloke up in the top of Yellowfield, um, and there was a, a Lamborghini Miura mm -hmm. um, and JPS Lotus Special. Nice. Yeah, and they were horrible. They they they'd been painted like thirty times, and he wanted too much money for them. Anyway, I, I kept going back, and the Lamborghini Miura was like they'd shrunk in a real car. It was perfect. It was made in Italy. It's got made in Italy written everywhere on it. Anyway. I bought them both um, and I restored them and I, I've got them hanging on the garage wall. I've got pictures on my phone if anyone wants to see them. Um, I restored them, they're hanging on the garage wall. I went up and showed him and he said, what is so nice that you come back and show me this? He said, people buy things from me every year and then they come back the next year and they try and sell them back to me because they've not done anything with it. Right. He said, yes. you've actually done it. And well, uh, I've got like two pieces of art on the wall, which are fabulous. Yeah, well, this is the other thing as well is that you Press ahead and get on with it. Yeah. When I, you talked to us uh, about this several years running, and I remember you, you, talk, you talked to Theo about it a couple of years ago. And I just thought, how's that? How's that going to happen? Then? Yeah. And, it, and, and knowing me and my own projects, it would be at a snail's pace. But really, considering what you've done, five years well, is no time at all. Well, last on your own last well. year when I um, when I had uh, Gene and uh, Glyn fly in from America from the publishing company for about mm. my book. Um, that um, Roger Attaway, the editor, was there, and we had a meeting, and they left shaking hands saying they would print this book, right? Now, at that time, that was really only halfway through. I wasn't in any particular hurry to finish it. It was probably about two thirds. Um, the doors were made, there was no bonnet, there was no skirts, the wings were on, the boot lid wasn't made, uh, the hard top that I've made for it, which I've got at home, that wasn't made. Um, and I took him up, I took him to the garage, Glyn, and I said to him, if this, wh wh what's the date for publishing? And he said, it'd be the end of August. And I said, I'll get this ready for the cover of the book. I, that was me personally thinking, if I'm gonna have my book printed, that's gotta be on finish. the cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he looked at it and he went, that's not possible, Andy. And I said, uh, Glyn, all I need is a deadline. I'll, I'll get that ready for you. Well. Firstly, there was two things really that went against me. Firstly, it was the hottest summer that we've ever had <laughs> yeah. since I was 16. Yeah. Secondly, was the fact that when I shook hands with him, I actually didn't have any concept of how much there was still to do um, yeah. on that. And with running the MOT station that during the day and everything, I did last year from April till, we actually had an extension till the second week of September, 
Um, I did 90 hour weeks for 23 weeks without a stop. Ouch. We were going in and then halfway through that in August, Maxine wanted to launch a lowrider yeah. at um, the Nationals and I that went over to the paint shop for him to get it into primer. And then while that was away, I'd done two weeks getting the low rider back together, getting the wheels on and all that. And then that went to the show and that come back. And then I just went straight into that. The bloke next door to the garage is a policeman and he's really nice. We get on really well with him. And his bedroom window's up there and at like 4.30 in the morning, I was outside spraying steering wheels and <laughs> so with, with the pressure really low so he couldn't hear me. Brilliant. But there's so, nothing like a deadline, though, is there? I mean, I know you get that it much. done with a deadline. Yeah, you well, do. with a magazine, you haven't yeah. got the option, have you? All the time, all the time. So, so when you actually managed to get that car ready for its its studio shoot, how did that feel moving that into the studio, and seeing it lit properly? I was I was just so knackered, I can't remember. <laughs> I've got Maxine phoned me up and she said, "What's it look like?" And I went, "Yeah, it's, it's all right." And I just I yeah, switched yeah, off by then. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. we got it back home and pushed it in the garage. And I didn't look at it until two weeks before the NEC because yeah. I. I had no interest in You've it at all, it. just You've finished. Been there too much. Yeah. Um, and then, like this year, I've sort of got to drive it and that, and it's, well, it's finished now, and it? I want to do something else. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing about a real, a real mechanic, a real engineer, a real, a real artist, it's all about the process in a way. Yeah, it? once it's finished, it's, it's finished. It's, it's done, yeah, yeah. It's done. Um, you, you say driven it, it drives well? Yeah, it's dri yeah it's, it, it is like driving old Riley. Yeah, like you've got yeah. the old gearbox wine, the rear axle wine, yeah. and, you know, Banksy it steering. Be. It's pretty horrible, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and how about... <laughs> Riley's Sorry. beautifully. <laughs> um, tell me, and, and tell me about the book as well, because actually having that... Firstly, how did that come about? Because that was... Well, it, it came... Because you're a bit of a legend. We all know you're a bit of a legend, but particularly for this car. How did um, it happen? There's a, a small fanzine style magazine in our world called Radar. Yeah. And it's printed by two blokes that couldn't give a toss what they say. They're just, it's very honest. And it's, a, but they, they're bringing custom bike features from like Korea and stuff. It's, okay. they're worldwide. Yeah. And one of them said about five years ago, he said, um, because you haven't got any kids or anything, he said, if you don't write your story, when you pop your clogs, there won't be anyone no to tell it. Yeah. And I kind of started it for them really, they were going to advertise it as like a little fanzine gazette thing in, in our hot rod world. And then, I don't know how it happened. I spent two, two and a half years writing it, excuse me. And then I bumped into Roger Attaway. Well, Roger Attaway used to run Rod and Custom show in Manchester back in the seventies, the yep. biggest custom show in Europe really. Um, he's written his own book. He's an author, he used to publish magazines. So he was extremely helpful. and pushed me in the right direction. Well, through a chap that used to work with him that did the layouts, um, he did the dummy layout of Indecision. And it was just bizarre, actually. The guy's retired now, he lives in Sussex somewhere. And he did the dummy layout for that chapter. Right, well, that's, that's Indecision, that's a Citroen CX, all built in steel when I was like 22. Um, anyway, he lives in the same village as Carl Ludwigson. And somehow he bumped into Carl Ludwigson and showed him that feature. And Carl Ludwigson said, I'm going to introduce, he read it and he said, his words are so good. He said, I'm going to introduce you to my publisher. Wow. And he'd done an introduction to Dalton Watson Fine Books and the rest is history. So they come over and said, yes. This is a great book, by the way. Um, <clears throat> I've read it. It is beautifully, beautifully made and beautifully, beautifully written. And it's a story of your life in cars, really. Yeah. And, and uh, car design th through my eyes, whether yeah. it's my work or not. What I want to know, though, is do you, do you still have these cars? Are they part of a No, no, no. That, um, I, I, I never advertise anything for sale because when I've finished it, it's kind of like the money that I've invested in it is like the money you'd have invested if you'd have gone out for six months or a year. Or played so, golf. Play anything, yeah, yeah your yeah, hobby yeah, is yeah. that, innit? Once it's gone, it's gone. Um, and then when someone contacts me from the website, you're kind of in a stronger position yeah, um, because yeah. you can say, well, you know, you make me an offer. Um, the most impressive chapter in here, um, not for any other reason apart from the fact that I, I, it's just so incredible. Um, this car here was a restoration. When I've, I've only done a few restorations, but when I've done them, they're always something very bizarre. Yep. That's the Aurora. Okay. Now, that was designed in the very early 50s in Bramford, Connecticut by a priest. Um, his name was Father Alfred Giuliano. 
What's going um, on with the windscreen? He he wanted to make the most the safest car in the world because at that time everything had chrome Dagmars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there was pictures of pedestrians on the Dagmars. Uh, drivers sat on chrome switches with them through their chest, and he was concerned. This windscreen here takes the contact point of the head to four and a half foot from where the driver sat. Um, plus it had seat belts. So the chances of anyone going through the windscreen was yeah. zero, right? Now, um, when I first finished that, it was launched at uh, Goodwood Festival of Speed in 2004. Yeah. And um, it, it had a, a lot of press. And then a couple of years, it was up here for six months, and then a couple of years later, it ended up on the front cover of the New York Sunday Times motoring page, right? And from that, I had massive amount of communication with people that knew of it, worked on it, done this, that, and the other. And I, I was polite, I replied to all of them, um, but it was just before my dad died. My dad had um, leukemia, and he was on his way out. So I kind of replied, and then I forgot all yeah. of it, right? Well. Right in this chapter, I wanted to make sure that I got the story correct. Sure. Okay. Um, so I started to go through this file, and I actually done phone interviews with two people, um, and, and this is this is just the most astounding thing. Um, there was one chap that I got to speak to. He's now ninety three. Yeah. Um, his name is Peter Molesky. Now, okay. This is Peter Molesky there, age eighteen. Oh wow. Okay. He was Father Giuliano's first full-time employee on that car. There were three of them for four and a half years okay. on this car. Um, these pictures are his. They've never, ever been seen by anyone until he posted them box, to me. There's all the wooden box. There's, on the next page, there's Father Giuliano laying the clay over the wooden buck to take the mould. Uh, fiberglass resin was so expensive then because it was it was a new medium father Giuliano would only allow himself to apply the resin and he would mix it one coffee cup at a time this, this is what oh, Peter, oh, oh. this is what Peter told me yeah now I've managed to rewrite the history of the end of this car because this picture here even Michael Lamb in California didn't know of this exhibition the Aurora was invited to the Madison Square Gardens Autorama in the middle of 1957, and it wasn't ready, but it was such a prestigious show that rather than miss it, they sprayed the clay buck in white primer. Wow. This is the three um, employees, uh, Ronnie Delquist, uh, Matt DiRizio, and Peter Molesky, um, at that show. And it was at that show that Father Giuliano advertised that it had safety features as yet not dreamt of by General Motors. Yes. And it was at that show he pissed them off enough for them to go against him. That extraordinary. Well, look, I'm he, showing the book to people. Um, he upset. Uh, let me. I've just, I've just got to show go this. On. Through these contacts that I made, yes. Je Jeffrey Hacker, have you heard of uh, Jeffrey yeah, Hacker? Heard of Jeffrey, um, he's yeah. the world officiator on fiberglass cars. He sent me this. That's the world patent application, um, December 1953. That yeah. was two years before they even started making it. He actually got a patent from the American Patent Office to actually build the safest car in the world. So, through me rewriting the end of it and clearing his name, um, people can come up and read this in a minute. The, the lady, Suzanne, who contacted me, her dad, she was only 10 or 12, but her dad bankrolled the Aurora to the point that her and her brother and her mum and dad lived in a one-bedroom flat for the whole five years of the build of this car. And this is her ending, and she's written to say thank you for clearing Father Giuliano's name. Now, I think when I got that car, I think it was jinxed. It was it was the worst job I've ever done. I hated the thing. It was yeah. horrible. It, everything, nothing went right with it. It was struggled. It, it's like it didn't want to be restored. Um, I got this book in the in the post, the first one, and I had a few tears of pride. And then I, I read this and that. A week later, I had an email from a museum in America, and they've bought it. They've. It feels like writing this story has cleared that. Um, jinx because it's gone to America and it's entered for next year's um, February 2024 Amelia Island concourse. 
Wow. Wow. So, I mean, we're scratching the surface of what Andy has done here. And, I mean, that I, I, had, nothing, I had no idea that you'd done that, Andy. And I had no, didn't no, you? no idea about the story. I knew no. you were involved in that car, but I didn't know the story behind it. All of those stories and more are contained within this extraordinary book, and you've got them for sale here, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, we got, yeah, we got so a few left. I, I would, I would. I've just, well, I've got to just add, right? Because <laughs> this is, uh, I know you want to shut oh, me no, up, but <laughs> it's fine. I'm loving every second of this. Um, I left secondary modern, unedu- uh, unqualified in English, right? Yeah. I, I never liked school. I didn't want to be there. I wanted to go home and work with my dad. Um, in May. Um, unbeknown to me, Dalton Watson entered it for the uh, book prize at Motor World Exhibition in Munich, and I've just flown back having won Best Book on Design, and I've just found out this week that it's been nominated for the RAC Virgin Writers Award as well. Round of applause for Andy for that. Not only is he an amazing car artist, he's a writer too. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Thanks very much. Does anybody have any questions before we wrap up for Andy? I mean, he's here, so you can come and ask him in person. But what an extraordinary story. And again, you know, the, how many cars are contained within the lease? 63. I feel 60, 63. 63 cars done by this man. That's, and sometimes that's three a year. Yeah, well, there's more to come as well, <laughs> it sounds like. Anyway, <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Andy. Yeah. And um, again, I, I knew it would be anyway. And we haven't even mentioned Juice My Lemon. No. No, no we didn't the, get round to that. The program that should have been. <laughs> but um, anyway, <laughs> ladies and round of applause. Uh, <laughs> Andy and his incredible creation. Have a Thank you very much. <laughs>